Good morning, and thank you so much. When asked by the Pharisee, what is the greatest commandment, the Savior did not hesitate and replied, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. How do we keep the first commandment, to love the Lord our God? We are taught that if you love me, keep my commandments. This is certainly true and is a critical way that we show our love. But we also know that our attempts to always keep the commandments will come up short. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A dear friend of mine refers to our time here on earth as earth school. In this earth school, we will make mistakes. Even the best of us, with the best of intentions, will be unable to keep all of the commandments all of the time. We will be incapable of showing the full measure of our love for our Lord through our own righteousness. But our loving Father knew this from the beginning, he provided a way for us to repent and be forgiven. The atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is plan A, not plan B. It is his plan for us to learn and to grow and to make mistakes while here in earth school. He wants us to have experiences here on earth that help us learn how to turn to him and ultimately return to him over and over through repentance. He wants us to not only gain a physical body, but to develop empathy for one another as a result of our experiences and our imperfections. So how then do we show our deep love for our Father in heaven when we are incapable of keeping all of the commandments all of the time? I believe the Savior showed the example for us. In Matthew chapter 25, he taught, For I was in hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. When we love and serve others and strive to keep the second commandment, it shows our love for our Father in heaven and helps us to keep the first commandment. They are two sides of the same coin. We show our love for the Lord by following his example and by loving and serving our neighbor. We cannot claim to love the Lord and judge or look down on those he paid the ultimate price to redeem. Who then is our neighbor? The Savior was asked this very question and responded so beautifully with the parable of the Good Samaritan. He taught us that everyone, all of God's children, are our neighbors. The parable begins as a lawyer asked the Savior, and who is my neighbor? Christ then shared this powerful story of a traveler from Jerusalem to Jericho who was attacked, robbed, wounded, and left by the wayside by thieves. Two people passed by him without offering aid. There was a priest, a church leader, a teacher, and a Levite, one who was assigned from the tribe to assist in the temple. Both of them passed by on the other side, neither stopping to help. Both were preoccupied or too busy with important assignments. Finally, the Good Samaritan did not pass by on the other side, but stopped to give immediate assistance. Jesus then said to the questioner and to us, Go and do thou likewise. As we look to the life and teachings of the Savior, we learn how to show this love. I would like to share three examples from the Savior's life to provide a pattern for us for how to love one another. The Savior taught us to see one another, how to serve one another, and how to forgive one another. First, how to see one another. The first is the story of Zacchaeus as found in the New Testament. Sister Sharon Eubank, first counselor in the General Relief Society Presidency, shared this story in the April 2019 General Conference Address entitled, The Light That Shines in the Darkness. Luke 19 tells the story of the chief tax collector in Jericho named Zacchaeus. He climbed a tree in order to see Jesus walk by. Zacchaeus was employed by the Roman government and viewed as, a corrupt, as corrupt and a sinner. Jesus saw him in the tree and called to him, saying, 
Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And when Jesus saw the goodness of Zacchaeus' heart and the things he did for others, he accepted his offering, saying, This day is salvation come to this house, for he is also a son of Abraham. Jesus knows my heart and sees me. He knows your heart and sees you. He expects us to do the same, to see each other with eyes of compassion and love. I have been a grateful recipient of someone seeing me for more than who I was at the present time. I joined the church as a nine-year-old young girl through my friendship with a neighborhood friend whose name was Christine, and she lived a few houses away. Our backyards were near Katie Corner to one another, and she and I had great adventures. Christine and Christina, we were inseparable. However, a few years later, my family moved to Washington, or from Washington to Oregon, but my best friend and I remained very close. We would visit each other regularly during the summer breaks, and our parents would drive several hours to meet halfway between Seattle and Portland to send us to one another's homes. Then we discovered the train that ran between the cities, and our parents would take us to the train station. I will never forget one particular trip. My best friend's father, Dave, was driving me to the train station to return to Portland. On the drive, he spent time talking to me about my life, my goals, where I saw myself in the future. He then shared with me a vision of who he saw that I could become. For the first time, I began to see myself differently. My family life at home was dysfunctional, and as he spoke with me, I began to believe that I could be someone different than my family path was leading me. He believed in me, he loved me, and that confidence in me has changed my life. Just as the Savior saw Zacchaeus in the tree, he wants us to look around and see one another, truly see one another with love and without judgment, for we are all works in progress. President Eyring, in his October 2018 conference address entitled, Try, 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 stated, Many years ago, I was first counselor to a district president in the eastern United States. More than once, as we were driving in our little branches, he said to me, Hal, when you meet someone, treat them as if they were in serious trouble, and you'll be right more than half the time. Not only was he right, but I have learned over the years that he was too low in his estimate. The Lord expects us to love and serve one another, to strive to see each other through his eyes with compassion. Second, how to serve one another. The Savior spent his life going about doing good. He taught us that as we serve one another, we show our love and we are serving him. I especially love the story of the Savior washing the feet of the apostles. He lowered himself down to clean arguably the lowliest and dirtiest part of our, their bodies, their feet. There is such rich symbolism here. Again, I've been a grateful recipient of such service. A number of years ago, my family purchased an old home in American Fork, Utah. This home had been built in stages, and the oldest stage dating to pre-1900. As we began remodeling, we encountered many surprises, some interesting and fun, such as the layers and layers of wallpaper that served as a time capsule walking us back through history. However, there were other surprises lurking in that old house. The kitchen was part of the older section of the house, and one morning, without warning, the fluorescent tube light fixture that hung from the ceiling gave way and swung down and crashed onto the floor, ripping the electrical line out of the ceiling and down the wall. Fortunately, my grandmother had just passed under with her morning orange juice <laughs> just before it fell, and no one was injured. This began the great kitchen remodel. The walls and the ceiling were lath and plaster, and as we attempted to repair the damage of the fallen light, the ceiling and walls, the ceiling began to crumble. We decided to remove the ceiling, but as we did, the walls began to crumble. Then we had to take down the cabinets, and next thing we knew, we were squarely into a full demolition and remodeling project that we had not quite intended. One day in particular, I will never forget, we began removing part of the wall and a section of the ceiling and discovered that hidden behind that wall was an old chimney. As we broke into the ceiling, years of soot that had laid dormant were released into the air in one large poof. The kitchen had open walkways into the dining room and the family room, and the black soot quickly spread out onto everything. No nook or cranny seemed safe. I remember looking around, myself now dirty with soot, and thinking, how will I ever get this clean? I felt overwhelmed. The soot was difficult to remove. It just seemed to stick to everything. I remembered that I had seen vans for Utah disaster cleanup companies and tried to call them. 
I explained my predicament, but they kindly let me know that their service was for other types of actual disasters. <laughs> I felt silly, but to me this felt like a disaster. I had little toddlers at the time, and now no place was safe and clean for them to play. I remember calling members of the ward and members of our extended family. They were so kind. They were so quick to drop what they were doing and come to help. They brought gloves, they brought cleaning supplies, one even drove down, drove down from Logan that day. They came and rolled up their sleeves and they didn't hesitate. I remember pausing during the cleanup and looking around at them. I felt such gratitude for their Christ-like examples. That day with the ceiling and walls literally crumbling around me, covered in soot, I felt as if I were certainly one of the least of these. I felt this gratitude and swelling in my heart many more times as I look at friends and family and coworkers helping clean, paint, and repair my home and basement during a recent life change that caused me to feel rushed to possibly sell my home. I felt it as I watched my children serve one another in small acts of kindness and inclusion. I have felt it as I watched news accounts of people helping others during recent events, such as fires, COVID, windstorms, and earthquakes. As we love and serve one another, we show pure love. At these moments, as we serve the least of these, we are serving our Savior. I hope that I'm able to repay all of the generous service that I've received over my lifetime. Third, how to forgive one another. The Savior showed his love in a way that none of us could. He gave his life for us. In John 15, 13, we learn, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The Savior gave us the ultimate gift of the atonement. With that gift, he expects us to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. The Savior showed us a perfect example of how to forgive others. On the cross, in the very depth of agony and feeling the weight of our sins, pain, and separation from the Father, the Savior's thoughts were turned towards others, and he said, forgive them, for they're not what they do. In April of 2007, President Faust, then second counselor in the first presidency, shared the following story that illustrates the peace that can come through forgiveness. In the beautiful hills of Pennsylvania, a devout group of Christian people live a simple life without automobiles, electricity, or modern machinery. They work hard and live quiet, peaceful lives separate from the world. Most of their food comes from their own farms. The women sew and knit and weave their clothing, which is modest and plain. They are known as the Amish people. A 32-year-old milk truck driver lived with his family in their nickel mines community. He was not Amish, but his pickup truck route took him to many Amish dairy farms, where he became known as the quiet milkman. Last October, he suddenly lost all reason and control. In his tormented mind, he blamed God for the death of his first child and some unsubstantiated memories. He stormed into the Amish school without provocation, released the boys and adults, and tied up the 10 girls. He shot the girls, killing five and wounding five. Then he took his own life. This shocking violence caused great anguish amongst the Amish, but no anger. There was hurt, but no hate. Their forgiveness was immediate. Collectively, they began to reach out to the milkman's suffering family. As the milkman's family gathered in his home the day after the shootings, an Amish neighbor came over, wrapped his arms around the father of the dead gunman, and said, we will forgive you. Amish leaders visited the milkman's wife and children to extend their sympathy, their forgiveness, their help, and their love. About half of the mourners at the milkman's funeral were Amish. In turn, the Amish invited the milkman's family to attend the funeral services of the girls who'd been killed. A remarkable peace settled on the Amish as their faith sustained them during the crisis. One local resident very eloquently summed up the aftermath of this tragedy when he said, we were all speaking the same language, and not just English, but a language of caring, a language of community, and a language of service, and yes, a language of forgiveness. It was an amazing outpouring of their complete faith in the Lord's teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. The family of the milkman who killed the five girls released the following statement to the public. To our Amish friends, neighbors, and local community, our family wants each of you to know that we are overwhelmed by the forgiveness, grace, and mercy that you've extended to us. 
Your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. The prayers, flowers, cards, and gifts you've given have touched our hearts in a way no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world. And for this, we sincerely thank you. Please know that our hearts have been broken by all that has happened. We are filled with sorrow for all of our Amish neighbors, whom we have loved and continue to love. We know that there are many hard days ahead for all of the families who lost loved ones, and so we will continue to put our hope and trust in the God of all comfort as we all seek to rebuild our lives. How could the whole Amish group manifest such an expression of forgiveness? It's because of their faith in God and trust in his word, which is part of their inner beings. They see themselves as disciples of Christ and want to follow his example. Hearing of this tragedy, many people sent money to the Amish to pay for the health care of the five surviving girls and for the burial expenses of the five who were killed. As a further demonstration of their discipleship, the Amish decided to share some of the money with the widow of the milkman and her three children because they too were victims of this terrible tragedy. Forgiveness does not always come so immediately. For some, it can take days, weeks, months, or even years to achieve. Forgiveness is not an event, but rather a journey. I have learned that the Savior is there with us through every step of that journey. Even as we strive to forgive, we may fall short, and the Lord can make up the difference. After all, the price has already been paid by him on behalf of whomever we are striving to forgive. If we can accept that and accept the atonement fully, we can let go of the need for justice for others and ourselves. I also feel a need to mention that throughout this journey, it is critical to remember the words of Elder Holland when he shared, Forgive and ye shall be forgiven, Christ taught in the New Testament times. And in our day, I the Lord will forgive whom I will forgive, but if you is required to forgive all men. It is however important for some of you living in real anguish to note what he did not say. He did not say, you're not allowed to feel true pain or real sorrow from the shattering experiences you've had at the hand of another. Nor did he say, in order to forgive fully, you have to enter, re-enter a toxic relationship or return to an abusive, destructive circumstance. But notwithstanding even the most terrible offenses that might come to us, we can rise above our pain only when we put our feet onto the path of true healing. That path is the forgiving one walked by Jesus of Nazareth, who calls out to each of us, Come, follow me. While it may not always come immediately, and there can be real pain, we are asked to forgive fully. I love a poem composed by Marguerite Stewart that is entitled Forgiveness Flower. The poem reads, When I went to the door, at the whisper of a knocking, I saw Simeon Gantner's daughter, Kathleen, standing there in her shawl and in her shame, sent to ask forgiveness flower for her bread. Forgiveness flower, we call it in our corner. If one has erred, one is sent to ask flower of his neighbors. If they loan it to him, that means he can stay. But if they refuse, he'd best take himself off. I looked at Kathleen. What a jewel of a daughter, though not much like her father. More's the pity. I'll give you flower, I said, and went to measure it. Measuring was the rub. If I gave too much, neighbors would think I made sin easy. But if I gave too little, they would label me close. While I stood measuring, Joel, my husband, came in from the mill, a great bag of flour on his shoulder. And seeing her there, shrinking in the doorway, he tossed the bag at her feet. Here, take all of it. And so she had, loaf, had flour for many loaves while I stood measuring. I hope that we can each be the type of people who can turn issues with others over to the Lord and who generously toss a bag of flour out to any we interact with. Let us not stand measuring, but be quick to love and forgive, as the Savior would have us do. The Lord has given us two great commandments, and other aspects of the gospel, all other aspects, fit under these commandments. He asks us to love him with all our hearts and to love one another. Then he lived and died in a way that showed us how to do this. Just like Zacchaeus, the Lord sees us up in our tree. He reaches out to us. He wants us to see one another as he sees us, including ourselves. He wants us to love and forgive ourselves when we err. And just like my friends and family who stood there shoulder to shoulder with me in the soot, he wants us to bear one another's burdens. 
Sometimes we are the one with the soot on us. Sometimes we are the one showing up with cleaning products and rolling up our sleeves, but we need each other. And as we serve each other, we show our love for our Father. And just as the Savior forgave each of us of our sins and weaknesses, he expects us to forgive one another. And when that's hard, when that feels really difficult to do, he is there to fill in the gap and guide us through. I am so grateful for my Savior. I am so thankful for his life and teachings and for the example that he set for me in all things. I am so grateful for the gift of repentance that allows me to be clean and to try again each day. I know that my Savior lives, and I know that he knows and loves me, and he knows and loves each of you. I know that as we focus on the two great commandments, that all other aspects of life will fall into place. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.